Hello everyone, welcome to the panel uh, number 26, uh, Nishida and others number two. Um, we will have two presenters, John Moraldo, who is Professor Emeritus um, of the University of North, uh, North Florida, Florida yeah. and um, Jonathan Navarro, who is from Universi Universitat Pompeu Fabra. Yeah, because we're a bit delayed, I will want okay. to ask okay. you to start okay. directly, John. Thank you. Thanks, everyone, for coming. I'm um, sorry for the confusion. I hope I don't add to it with my talk today been um, very energizing, but I appreciate your being here after such a, a long, intense today, day already. So um, I'm going to talk about uh, Nishida phenomenology and self-awareness. So my, my, um, my aim is really to see what Nishida might have to contribute to contemporary uh, philosophy of self-awareness as it's handled by phenomenologists. Uh, of course, Nishida could learn an awful lot from the phenomenologist, but that's not what I'm going to try to do today. I'm going to try rather to focus on what he himself might have to uh, offer. And this will mean that um, somehow I have to try to make sense out of Nishida for phenomenologists, which is not always an easy task. Uh, so the first thing I'm going to do is um, present a short uh, little history of the evolution of consciousness that's presented in a novel called Nutshell by Ian McEwan. And I will also then end my talk today with another passage from another novel. So let's take a look quickly at this. I've heard it argued that long ago pain begat consciousness. To avoid serious damage, a, serious, a simple creature needs to involve, evolve the whips and goads of a subjective loop, of a felt experience, not just a red warning light in the head, who's there to see it, but a sting, an ache, a throb that hurts, adversity forced awareness on us. And it works, it bites us when we go too near the fire, when we love too hard. Those felt sensations are the beginning of the invention of the self. And if that works, why not feeling disgust for shit, fearing the cliff edge and strangers, remembering insults and favors, liking sex and food? God said, let there be pain. And there was poetry, eventually. My question is, from what point of view is this uh, whimsical theory of consciousness presented? Uh, and I want to look at this because I want to present the phenomenological standpoint on the questions that I'll be treating. Um, so the theory actually in the novel is presented as um, the, the thoughts of a boy about to be born. He's obviously conscious. Uh, he's self-aware. And um, so we're going to take a look at that. The theory itself that you just read, I'll go back to it. Uh, says that um, before there was anything like self-consciousness, sensations of pain gave rise to something like a feedback loop that produced a reflective awareness of the pain so that the organism could protect itself and, um, from whatever was harming it. And all of this without first there being anyone there, anyone to see the warning light, any self or ego. Uh, so this theory... Um, spoken by the boy about to be born, is presented from a third-person point of view. Now, the question that phenomenologists will ask is, well, what is, uh, what or who is the observer, the spectator, who presents this theory of consciousness? What, what consciousness presents or gives for you to, con to uh, contemplate this whimsical theory about the evolution of consciousness. Um, that consciousness, that awareness that's presenting this theory to you in the first place is not just a phenomenon among others in the world. Um, and if we forget that, it's as if we were watching a film and forgetting and taking the film at face value and forgetting that we are there watching the film. Uh, so it's that background consciousness 
that phenomenologists are interested in. Now, um, the word consciousness is really a word that has a lot of different meanings. And so I'm going to point out three meanings uh, that are somewhat intertwined, somewhat overlapping. Uh, but it will be the third meaning that is important for the phenomenologists. Um, and to clarify one thing, I'm going to use the word self-consciousness and self-awareness synonymously in this presentation, just as Nishida at least sometimes used the expressions uh, jikoishiki and jikaku synonymously. Uh, so we won't try to make a distinction between those, at least for purposes today. Okay, so what are the three meanings? First of all, to be conscious means to be awake, more or less aware, instead of asleep or unconscious. And that's the kind of consciousness that um, neuroscientists are now trying to locate as an activity of a brain or even a particular part, uh, an activity of a particular part of the brain. Secondly, to be conscious means to have subjective states of, of felt experience, to experience what some philosophers called qualia. That is uh, how, for example, uh, red appears to me as opposed to you. Um, the Thomas Nagel used the famous phrase, uh, what it's like to be something, to describe this kind of consciousness. So those two senses overlap some. However, the kind of the sense of consciousness that's most important for the phenomenologists is rather different. Their consciousness or awareness means that which lets things appear in the first place, that which manifests things to us, manifests people, brains, bodies, other things in the world, scientific inferences about them, ideas, dreams, even the existence of things that were not immediately aware of. So that meaning, that ground meaning of consciousness is um, what is at stake in phenomenology. And it's also, I think, with some adjustments, Nishida's meaning of consciousness. Manifestation, disclosure, and illumination, to use a visual metaphor, um, are the meanings here of consciousness. So for example, if neuroscientists find evidence that conscious states are produced by certain activities in the brain, the phenomenologist would point out that brains and their activities must first be evident or disclosed to the scientists. And scientists must be in a position to observe or infer data uh, about these things and to, and to uh, conclude something from that data. Now, in the novel Nutshell, the history of consciousness, again, is imaginatively viewed by the unborn boy who already exhibits consciousness and to whom things appear. So again, this primary sense of consciousness doesn't refer to consciousness as some other thing, some object or some phenomenon in the world. Nishida says over and over again that it cannot be objectified. Uh, so this is the sense that phenomenology has in mind and Nishida has in mind, I think. Uh, it's indicated, for example, in Nishida when he speaks of seeing, even seeing without a seer. Uh, in Nishida, however, this phenomenological sense is overshadowed by his own emphasis on the structure of consciousness, the structure of awareness. And that structure he exhibits in terms of reflection. Um, so I'm going to talk a little bit about the notion of reflection in phenomenology and in contemporary philosophy. Uh, in Nishida, it's a matter of self-reflecting. One of his constant refrains is that which reflects itself in itself. Last year at the conference in Barcelona, I pointed out that there is a deep ambiguity in the way that Nishida uses the terms related to reflecting and, and reflection. Uh, on the one hand, sometimes Nishida uses an optical metaphor. He uses the words translated usually as uh, mirroring or reflecting in the optical sense, utsusu in Japanese. And, he, and that's written in two different ways, and he uses them more or less synonymously. That's on the one hand. 
On the other hand, the other meaning of, of reflection uh, that he sometimes refers to is reflection as a form of thinking, thinking back upon something, considering something, hansei suru. The problem is this. Nishida sometimes mixes these two up. He uses them uh, sometimes nearly synonymously and sometimes uh, even in the same sentence. Uh, the problem is also that the optical sense of reflecting or mirroring of Utsusu um, makes sense as a kind of structure of things, but it does not convey the phenomenological sense of consciousness, of Hansei Suru. So that was the problem I presented last year, and I actually brought a handout for any of you who want to uh, look at the documentation of it. Now, Nishida usually stresses the reflective structure of consciousness or awareness, and he understates the, what I'm calling the phenomenological sense. Um, so the problem then would be to show or to question whether Nishida's philosophy, has, Nishida's philosophy of reflection has anything to contribute to current discussions of self-awareness in phenomenology. Uh, so what I want to do next is look at um, the, sorry, I missed this slide, uh, the, the sense of, uh, the senses of reflection in contemporary phenomenology. Uh, so I've taken a short summary from uh, an article by Sean Gallagher and Dan Zahabi to, for this. I'll read it quickly. On the phenomenological view, a minimal form of self-consciousness is a constant feature of conscious experience. Experience happens for the experiencing subject in an immediate way, and as part of this immediacy, it is implicitly marked as my experience. For phenomenologists, this immediate and first personal givenness of experiential phenomena is accounted for in terms of pre-reflective self-consciousness. In the most basic sense of the term, self-consciousness is not something that comes about the moment one attentively inspects or reflectively introspects one's experiences or recognizes one image in the mirror or refers to oneself with the use of the first-person pronoun or constructs a self-narrative. Rather, these different kinds of self-consciousness are to be distinguished from pre-reflective, self-consciousness, which is present whenever I am living through or undergoing an experience, whenever I am consciously perceiving the world, when I, whenever I am thinking and a current thought, whenever I'm feeling sad or happy, thirsty or in pain, and so forth. First-person experience presents me with an immediate and non-observational access to myself. Phenomenal consciousness consequently entails a minimal form of self-consciousness. So there's uh, four points that I, I want to have us look at in this brief summary. First of all, the basic form of all consciousness is pre-reflective. Uh, secondly, it assumes that all experiencing is first personal, that all experiences in, is experiencing from the perspective of someone who's living or undergoing the experiences. Now, this will be uh, somewhat modified in the case of Nishida, as we'll see. Thirdly, um, this summary ref argues that pre-reflective self-consciousness is different from and prior to any act of reflection on oneself. Acts of reflection, like thinking and speaking about one's experiences, are secondary, and they presuppose a more basic pre-reflective self-awareness. Uh, this view, this paragraph that we read, implies that one's secondary, afterward self-reflections, they might give rise to an explicit sense of self, but that sense of self still has to match up with an implicit sense of self. The reflections take as their reference a sense of self that's already there prior to reflection and not simply generated by it. This prior sense of self is prior to any concept of self that's generated, say, by the encounter with others or by acquisition of language and, and concepts. 
The fourth point, this is really important for looking at the case in terms of Nishida's philosophy. The summarized position by the phenomenologist does not claim that I am always and necessarily explicitly aware of myself um, as an actor behind my actions or uh, a thinker behind the thoughts. It does not contradict Nishida's famous statement in the preface to Zen no Kenkyu, namely, where he says, it is not that there exists an individual and thus there is experience, but that there is experience and thus the individual exists. That statement itself is somewhat ambiguous because the term kojin is not defined. Uh, Nishida says, by the way, that what he's trying to do is avoid solipsism. He's trying to, to say that uh, individual differences are not basic, what's basic in experience. He says experience is more fundamental than individual differences. Um, in, the, in the summary that I just uh, gave by the phenomenologist, the, the first personal character of all experiencing describes all of us, not some individuals as opposed to others. Now, Nishida also refers directly to the first personal character of experience when he says, for example, at the beginning of Zen no Kenkyu, when one's own state of consciousness is directly experienced, there is not yet a subject and not yet an object. Knowing and its object are completely unified. Commentators uh, usually, of course, point out the part about pure experience that says it's prior to the split between subject and object. Uh, but this part about one's own state of consciousness is just as important, I think. If we very cautiously use the word subjectivity to indicate the first person character of experience, then it looks as if Nishida is proposing a kind of subjectivity without a subject which is also what Heidegger was doing later. Nishida's very use of terms like experience at least imply the phenomenological character of, of showing in consciousness or awareness. His persistent talk of the self, the true self, the historical self, and so forth, the, the uh, what is it called, the eichiteki, um, the intelligible self, uh, all of these are a con continual affirmation of the self that mirrors itself within itself. Um, throughout his career, Nishida shows that he does not deny the, ex the reality of an experiencing aware self, however non-substantial that self might be. Nishida rarely spoke of a non-self, or he rarely used terms like muga. However, even in that case, I would suggest that we read uh, the, the prefix self in expressions like self-experience, or that we read ji of jikaku um, as, a ref as a, what they call in grammar, a reflexive expression, such as the words uh, zich in, in German, or reflexive um, pronouns in French and in Spanish that indicate actions where the actor and the, and the recipient are the same. Uh, these expressions, even if they use the word self in English, do not refer to some entity called the self. Even in phenomenology, the prefix self in, self, in, in pre-reflective self-awareness, that expression does not refer to an entity that we call the self. In fact, uh, the two phenomenologists I quoted, Gallagher and Zahavi, Zahavi, point out that phenomenologists are not in agreement about whether there is an ego or self, but they do agree that self-awareness is at its base pre-reflective. Earlier I said that Nishida uses and sometimes conflates two senses of reflection only one of which implies subjectivity or phenomenal first-person perspective. Uh, he explicitly re refers to the reflective structure of self-awareness far more often than he talks about or even directly implies the phenomenal or subjective character of experience. 
I see this as a problem. Uh, it was a big problem for me last year, but I've come to the conclusion that Nishida simply assumes self-presence or subjectivity in that broad sense of the word. The question then would be whether his notion of reflection has something to add to phenomenological discussions of self-awareness, and I think it does. I'll point out um, six points where I think Nishida has something to offer. Sorry, I keep skipping some of the slides. Um, so, first of all, self-awareness, Chikaku in Nishida, I'm saying, presupposes a phenomenological sense. His uh, metaphors of reflection or mirroring take the phenomenological awareness for granted. Um, the metaphor for mirroring does not itself entail awareness, but it presupposes it. And here's why. You can't talk of mirrors and what's reflected in them unless you presuppose some sort of mind or consciousness that perceives some things as mirrors and other things as, as images in mirrors. Nishida himself implies the phenomenological awareness in the sense of letting things appear. And many, again, and many of the key terms he employs, experience, uh, you know, uh, keiken, taiken, consciousness, self-consciousness, self-awareness, uh, and later, even in terms like, that are translated into English, at least, as expressivity, um, uh, I guess that would be hyogensei or something, uh, which could also be translated as presentation. In fact, if you look at those two kanji separately, they can both be read arawasu. They double the sense of letting appear. Zero minutes? And, <laughs> and, uh, really? Yeah, if, if we want to have discussion. Okay. Uh, you're right. You're absolutely right. Okay. I'm, here's what I'm going to do. I will just um, at least name, I'm sorry, name the um, points that I think Nishida has to offer to phenomenologists. Uh, secondly, he says that reflection, I'm sorry, self-awareness is inherently reflexive. It's not a prior stage, it's not pre-reflective, it's not a subsequent stage, uh, a reflective self or reflective self-awareness. Self it's inherently, it's inherently reflexive. And so if we wanted to, we could write reflection with an X instead of a CT. Secondly, or fast now. Uh, thirdly, Nishida's reflexivity suggests how a stage prior to reflection can generate reflection, can provide access to this pre-reflective stage. Phenomenology, I think, does not do a very good job of, of uh, showing that. Um, thirdly, reflexivity in Nishida, at least, suggests how self-awareness moves beyond itself. And this is a really important sense. Uh, this is the sense in which he can begin to talk about um, the, the self-awareness of the world, for example, uh, because it has this re reflexive structure. It mirrors itself in itself. Uh, so this is really important to see, especially when you look at the kanji for utsusu, the one that, that is, is written to mean sometimes like uh, reproduce or take a picture of or just make more of the same. Uh, in the case of Nishida, reflection and the, that structure of awareness shows how they entail broader concepts, um, which gets into his philosophy of place. Uh, so reflexivity suggests how this self-awareness moves beyond the self. Um, fifthly, uh, it introduces a possible distinction between subjective, personal senses of self-awareness and uh, self-awareness that is manifesting or disclosing. Uh, and sixthly, it, Nishida's sense shows how self-awareness is not just a kind of activity of uh, consciousness in a narrow sense, uh, certainly nothing like a mind, but is a, a bodily uh, activity um, suggested by his terms koiteki chokkan, 
uh, in a kind of thing that, uh, a kind of self-awareness that can be cultivated, that can be practiced. Uh, and so some of this has to do with um, his talk about, for example, becoming the thing experienced, monotonaru. Uh, or he says, for example, to use a wonderful, a wonderful sentence that is um, that I got from uh, Yuko Ishihara's dissertation. I, I'm looking at a flower. At this moment, the flower is me, and I am the flower. Sense of the a unitary sense of self-consciousness. So these statements presuppose an initial first-person self-presence, rather than denying it. Uh, so. I'm going to end, I uh, have to end now. I'm going to end with a quotation that I think indicates Nishida's sense of how self-awareness is a part of bodily engagement in the world and something that can be cultivated and practiced. And this is a uh, quotation from another novel called The Elegance of the Hedgehog. Um, it describes a scene where one of the characters, Levin, is helping the peasants in wheat fields. He's helping them cut the wheat with the scythe, and he's very clumsy at first. He tries to do it exerting his own will, willpower, and pretty soon he's totally exhausted. But then something happens. With each successive pause and start, his awkward, painful gestures become more fluid. Gradually, his movements are freed from the shackles of his will, and he goes into a light trance, which gives his gestures the perfection of conscious, automatic motion, without thought or calculation, and the scythe seems to move of its own accord. Levin delights in the forgetfulness that movement brings, where the pleasure of doing is marvelously foreign to the striving of the will. So I take this as an example of Nishida's uh, inactive experience. You know, sorry. Yeah, thank you, John, for finishing uh, the presentation in zero minutes. And we don't have a bit of time for a few questions. So if there are any questions, please come forward. Yeah. Jim. Jim. I have a problem with the connection between your very last comments and the rest of the paper. OK. Because everything you described in terms of phenomenology and initiative of consciousness was disembodied. All the, the images, we talked about this yesterday in the newspaper, all the images were optical. They're mirrors, they're reflections, they're yeah. seen, yes. which is very logic friendly. It's yes. very abstract. Whereas bodily friendly metaphors would lead to completely different ways of talking about consciousness. Mm -hmm. For example, if you use metaphors of sound, like Kuk, I guess, if you use metaphors of touch, like the Flemish mystics do, as opposed mm -hmm. to the, to the, group, the, the Rhine mm -hmm. mystics. Yeah? We mm -hmm. talked about this yesterday. Mm -hmm. But it seems to me that, if, that when Nishida says, Keikengate Kojingaru, why didn't he say Taikengate Keikengaru? Mm -hmm. Because his Keiken wasn't my experience at all. It was this pure experience. Something happens mm -hmm. to the individual. It isn't mm -hmm. I experience something mm -hmm. and my individuality arises, but something happens. Keiken mm -hmm. is not Taikeng. Mm -hmm. mm -hmm. And this disembodied problem is. Uh, is one that it seems from your presentation that it shares with phenomenology. Mm -hmm. So the leap of your very last comment, mm -hmm. um, I don't see the bridge. Okay, good. The, there's the leap there because I had to. Uh, I had zero minutes, <laughs> which I expanded <laughs> expanded into five. Uh, it, so I had to leave out a part where Nishida himself changes. He changes. You know, he's because of the criticisms of Tanabe and Tosaka. He starts looking at. Uh, history, movement, the historical body, social contexts, and that's when his notion of the, his, the historical body uh, arises, and when he's in his notion of um, inactive intuition, or however we want to translate it, koiteki chokan, uh, and he does use the term taiken sometimes, but he says quite literally that action as a way of being conscious is still a way that the self is reflexively self-aware. He says that. That's a sentence out of, of what he says. Um, so uh, I agree with you that 
they're, they're, it's still a leap, and it, it's, uh, it's a very important leap. It's a very important advance, I think, that is hardly beginning to be recognized by phenomenologists. It's recognized more by people who work in uh, inaction theory, but like Barella, uh, but less so, is, to my knowledge, by uh, phenomenologists who are still tuck, stuck in a kind of more mental kind of uh, self-awareness. Any other questions? Still have zero minutes, so. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but because we started a bit late, maybe one more question. You're going to leave me off the hook, huh? <laughs> Sure. What's the difference between the displacement of subject in, with Heidegger, in Heidegger? Mm -hmm. You are talking about displacement in Ishida? Yes. Yeah. Well, OK. Displacement is my, is my term, but it was what the, the reflective self, then the reflecting, well, can't say that. The reflective self is displaced in, in Nishida with uh, notions of the world. And of course, the big problem for phenomenologists, I think, is to try to figure out what it means to say that the world is self-aware. Uh, it could make sense to say that the world reflects itself in itself and the, that, but, you know, the world doesn't have consciousness. Okay, so what do you mean when you say this is the problem with Ueda and Nishitani? Uh, so when I uh, spoke of displacement, world displacing the reflective self, uh, I was using my own term. Now, in Heidegger, there's, I'm not so sure that he talks so much of replacement, but he talks about certain kinds of withdrawal. Uh, it's kind of the opposite move. So when, uh, when I'm engaged in something bodily, um, like hammering is the example that Heidegger uses, then the world has withdrawn. You know, I am, I am unconscious of this context of meanings uh, until, say, the hammer breaks. And then I say, oh my gosh, you know, what am I going to do now? So all of this chain of intentions comes to light when that happens. I realize I've been hammering to build a box to uh, contain a, a, a work of art that I want to exhibit, and so on and so forth. And that's when the horizon of world uh, shows itself. Um, but, but, but otherwise, it's a kind of withdrawal of the world. And then later, Heidegger, it's the withdrawal of the earth, perpetual withdrawal of the earth in context or in contest to, to the world. Earth and world become a kind of pair in later Heidegger. OK, thank you. So I think. Thank you for the very nice talk and have a good night.